Yeah, that makes it sound, I guess, more heroic than it. I mean, because the reality was that I arrived in those places and I was like so like excited to have these jobs and like so I felt so like, oh man, I work at Microsoft, like cool. But then I was also like really intimidated by the way everybody did everything. And I just assumed that it was, I mean, that the Steve Jobs quote is very accurate. Like I assumed it's done this way for a very smart reason. And I just tried my best for years to conform. Like how do I get along and do my small part in a way that is fun for me? And that still does have a through line to like creating things and that feeling of possibility. Hi, my name is Aran Dror, and this is Remake, a podcast about design systems and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, new venture, or new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. Today, I'm talking to Jake Knapp. Jake is one of the most influential product designers in the world today. He's the creator of the design sprint process at Google and Google Ventures, and a best-selling author of two books, Sprint and Make Time. So let's get started with Jake Knapp. So um, I'm sitting here across the screen from Jake Knapp. Uh, Jake is one of the most influential product designers today. He created the design sprint process at Google. He's a best-selling author of two books uh, that you actually can see behind me. Uh, and at least one of these books, the one that I have many copies of, is always here. It's not, it's always uh, prominent like this. <laughs> not just because. <laughs> right, not just because I'm talking to you. This one, I actually turned sideways. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. So, um, and if you're just listening to the audio, it's the Lord of the Rings that, that Aaron's pointing at. Oh, yeah. That, actually, that's my I, book. That's, I, that's do my have, book. Oh. I do have Lord of the Rings right here, too. Um, <laughs> but that's actually, um, yeah, that's not necessarily related to Jake, but also related to Jake. No, that's my other book, right. Sprint yeah. and Lord of the Rings. That's, uh, a lot so of people you don't know that are J.R.R. Tolkien. I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering who got to be that. Uh, cool. Cool. So, um, so, so, um, you know, we have probably a ton of different things that we could talk about, um, you know, but first I wanted to just thank you for being here and thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Um, it's super cool. Um, and, and I guess the first thing before I kind of dive into a more podcasty kind of, uh, interview, <laughs> uh, is I wanted to ask like, how are you doing these days? Like how, what's, like this is this is a, one of the craziest times in you know um that i've seen uh and uh, probably a lot of people so you know i what's what's the situation over there i may not be fully up to speed yeah yeah well thanks for having me on thank you for putting up with my we connected and i didn't have my i didn't even have my camera plugged in i am uh, notoriously this takes me a long time to get started doing everything so i appreciate your patience and that's a that's a very that's a very thoughtful question for you to to ask i i think that the the reality is i'm doing okay and i don't i won't try to you know uh sort of to paint a picture of, um, of a high performing, you know, um, just rolling with all the punches and capitalizing with new hustles and new business opportunities. And, and, uh, this is when things go crazy and get torn apart. There is, there are opportunities there for sure. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, like the reality is it's been a tough year. And I know it's been a tough year for a lot of people, definitely for, for me and, and my family have had some some struggles with it. Uh, my son got what we think was was COVID nineteen and got really sick actually, and he's wow. he's getting better now. But it's taken months for his uh, lungs to recover, and there there's still uh, there still has some challenges there. But getting better and um, and school over video is is it's tough for kids, you know, it's isolating and and that's that's tough and. You know, uh, so I think it's the same, I think it's the same issues everybody's dealing with, but they, 
um, they, they definitely uh, don't, I, I have not, I have not developed any great techniques for, for av- av- avoiding or like transcending those, <laughs> those problems that everybody's having. Yeah. How about uh, you? How are you holding up during all this? Um, you know, I, I'm usually super jealous of people with families and kids and, um, you know, kind of a fuller life in some ways. Um, but not during this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, uh, have a large apartment all to myself. Um, I, um, I bu- so I started a couple of hobbies. I start, uh, one in, in particular right before COVID hit. I bought a violin just because I wanted to learn, and now I have all the time to practice. I you know I still have meetings, but they're on Zoom, so I can you know, and um, and you know there's this food deliveries in Israel is actually um, I, you know I don't want anybody to hate me who's in a tougher uh, place, but Israel uh, has been open. Uh, more or less for a couple of months now. Um, we still oh, wear masks, but you know, I, you know, I went to the pool today uh, to swim, and I, oh, you wow. know, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's mostly empty because uh, the kids are in school now, so it's, um, yeah. you know, but um, but yeah, you can go to a ros- restaurant, um, and they they're doing it by city, so some cities are stricter. Uh, if there's more cases, and I'm in one of the best cities to be in, so I'm, you know. Uh, luckily doing pretty well. Um, well, great. Thanks. That's great to hear Aaron. I'm really, uh, really happy for you over there. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's wonderful. We're, <laughs> it was basically, uh, you know, I describe to people who aren't in the United States who wonder what it's like. It's basically like Mad Max Fury road here. <laughs> Just like, that's, that's what it's like. <laughs> um, yeah, no. So, I mean, I think it's just, I mean, if it was just COVID, um, but you know, there was more, um, of an agreement on what's the right thing to do and more of a kind of a harmony. And there wasn't, you know, all the other stuff that are rolled into it. Um, so, uh, you know, before kind of, cause, cause, cause I do want to, I mean, you're such an interesting person and we have, we can, t- we will talk about all the other great stuff, but like, are you able to look at what's going on? Um, in the news and in the kind of in, uh, in your surrounding. And I mean, I know there's probably uh, demonstrations and, you know, um, a lot of chaos. And are you able to look at that and, and feel some optimism? Are you, how do you process? Yeah. You know, it's easier to feel optimism when I pay, uh, less frequent attention to the news. Like the more I look at it and I'm not going to lie to you. Like I, I find the news as fascinating as anybody. And I, I do read it. I read it more than I intend to. Um, you know, the one thing that I am definitely able to avoid is, is watching news on TV. We don't, we don't have a TV and that's, uh, that's a good like mental health thing for me. Cause I love TV and I would just be, you know, watching it right now, I wouldn't even be talking to you, but no offense, but, um, but, uh, I'm not but, TV. But, but, yeah. But, but even, yeah, you're just not TV. So, um, but, uh, the, but, but the, any news is designed to keep you hooked. It's designed to give you the yeah. most outrageous thing. That's going to like fire you up and different news outlets over whether it's, designed intentionally from the start or whether it's what evolves over time, they've, they develop their niche, their market fit, and it's who can they outrage, you know, the most and fire up the most. Cause that's how they get attention. And, and yep. it's not to say that the things you read in the news, like aren't based in fact, like they're all right. Those things are going on, but they choose, they're selecting which things to amplify sure. sometimes for good. But if you watch if you pay attention to it all the time and I, and I do, I do, I go on this trap I've paid too much attention to it. So trying to monitor it all the time and be in this like alert mode and kind of this like danger mode all the time is really stressful. And it's been hard this year to stay out of that because yeah. sometimes the things really were like, it did feel like we need to know what's going on. Yeah. Like certainly with, you know, with, with COVID there are, there were times, especially in the beginning, there are times when like you really like need to know what's going on because it personally impacts your safety. And maybe today, like something you need to know about how you behave today, or you, 
you know, you need to know the, um, the, the protests that have been happening here with uh, Black Lives Matter. Like, the, I mean, that's important stuff. It's important to be up to date on that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and we had protests with, uh, I live in Seattle and very close to us, we had protests where they, there were tear gassing and like, I, th- I think you and I were emailing about this. Then they had, you know, they, they blocked off like part of the city and the, or, you know, like a block or two and the protesters kind of yeah. set up camp in there for, um, for a while. And, you know, that's like, I, I do need to know that cause it's, it's right down the street. And also I need to know cause it's important. It's like an important thing, but yeah, it's like to answer your question, uh, it, it is, it is possible if I'm, if I'm following it every day, if I'm reading the news more than once a day, if I'm refreshing, it's hard to not just see the noise and not just feel the like fight or flight. Hmm. If, if I, you know, when you zoom out and you say, man, this is, this is good. Like the, the, the black lives matter protests are really good because they have, they have opened up a new era of conversation and, and debate about what we should be doing as a, as a country. And I think that America has done, uh, there's so much wrong here. Um, but I also know we're not the only country in the world that struggles with this. And a lot of people, America is a very visible country. So what happens here, people will see elsewhere and it won't get solved like this, this month or this year, or like, it's going to take a really long time. But anyway, that's, you, you know, if you, if you zoom out, if you imagine like the, the longer term horizon view of this, this is really good stuff that's happening, but it's very painful as it's happening. And I think a lot of the things, a lot of things will change post COVID will be good things, but they're very painful right now. And that's not to say that like COVID is a good thing. Like it, it's, it's horrible, but you know, there, there are things that will be, that will be good that will come out of it. I think it's cool that like you and I are having this conversation over video. And I mean, we, you know, we did, we've had video conversations before like, but we're more likely to be able to do that, to have like, it'd be maybe easier for you and I to like maintain a friendship. And like, we live almost literally on like the opposite sides of the, of the planet. Mm. And that's pretty cool. You know, and there, there, there are many opportunities there that I think are, I think are interesting. We've realized in our own lives uh, as a family that like, well, maybe, you know, what, what really matters to us? Like I've been, over the past few years traveling as much as I can to while people are interested in design sprints, I want to teach it. I want to talk about it. And I love traveling. I love meeting people and doing that. Mm. But this, these last few months where you can't do that, it's been interesting. It's made us kind of reassess like, you know, how much do you really need to, to do that? What matters? I don't know. So I think there, there are good things going on in very painful ways. I guess that's my, that's my, yeah. my head summary of that. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I feel uh, very much the same way. I mean, I, I celebrated my 40th uh, birthday at the time of uh, the tightest uh, quarantine um, in Israel. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, that was, you know, c- uh, kind of hard, but we ended up doing a Zoom party. Um, and I had my cousin who lives in London and some friends from America and some friends from Israel all meeting each other for the first time. Um, you know, uh, so that was kind of, you know, uh, yeah. you can That's kind of cool, enjoy right? that. Uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but also I have this tendency to, um, really see it, it's, it's intellectualizing. So it's, it's, it's a way to defend from pain by saying um, every great pro- every progress in, in history has always come from a lot of chaos and, and pain. And, yeah. and some of these things had to happen. Uh, and some of these things, uh, specifically with Black Lives Matter, but you know, with police brutality, uh, these are things that were there and they had to explode and they had to change. And in a way you have to be grateful that it happens now and not in 50 years. You know, even with like COVID and Trump, I bet a large part of the American population understands why it's important that the president is smarter than you. Like I that that it's an important <laughs> qualification uh, yeah. because because I've I've met people. You know, I mean, I was actually uh, in America for a few months during uh, the end of the campaign, uh, Trump's campaign. Yeah, talk to people. 
And you know, a lot of people said because he, he's not he, they, they like him because he doesn't talk, he's not talking like a politician, and and he's like you know he's like us. And part yeah. of it is like, you yeah. don't want someone like you, you're yeah. an idiot. And I'm an idiot <laughs> way smarter than us who speaks very carefully, is not very candid because he thinks about the implication of his words on, you know, global markets or something. That's who you want. It is an interesting, that's an interesting thing though that, and I don't know how much, like, I don't know how much that's American like, culturally, but we very highly value uh, you know, like being, being like plain spoken. Yeah. That's, that's like super, super highly valued here, I think. And like, it can, and I actually think it can be a mark of someone who is very smart. Like, you know, sometimes in order to be able to talk about things that are complex in plain language, mm. is, that's very difficult to do. You can talk in plain, like anybody can talk in plain language would like be stupid, but yeah. it's, it's actually hard to, to talk about complicated things and make them feel, uh, and make them simple. Yeah. And, you know, that's, they're, they're certainly, those are the kinds of, you know, scientists and leaders who I think we admire them the most. But I do think that the... I don't think the future here holds more, more presidents who, more leaders in general, let's say, who speak in very sophisticated ways. I think it, it holds, I hope it holds people who are, are plain spoken and, you know, charismatic and, and friendly who are also very principled and very bright. But, um, but I think given the choice, we will choose the, person who you'd like to you'd most like to hang out with you know yeah and um and I, that's like i think you can go back like many elections and you'd see that that's the person who won you know probably mm -hmm. i mean definitely like uh, i mean if just we could just go back to like like trump versus uh versus clinton you know yeah yeah like he he just like seems like more of like a sort of a regular guy like it's not to say there aren't like there are all these other dynamics but i mean just if you like simplify down to one thing like it seems like this is true like mm. he just seems like i guess he seems like to, to more people he seems like more of a regular guy not everyone would agree but like to more people he seems like more of like i guess he's like a nice guy you know um if you just sound like a normal person and i don't know is that like in israel is that the case like how much does that does that matter um i don't know i mean i i think um there there's uh there's a word that that uh is a big part of vocabulary which is ugly i think it comes from arabic but it means like yeah, speak plain yeah. like speak the brutal honest truth um uh and um and so you expect that we expect that from all the leaders uh, but we also, I, th I think by and large, everyone agrees that, you know, whoever is the prime minister has to be smart, like smarter yeah. than us, like, uh, you know, yeah. like capable of managing a very complex system. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Well, in the prime minister too, though, you, I mean, you have, that's, they're elected by the, by the parliament, right? By the, um. It's not direct. It's not a direct election for the it's, prime minister. It's, uh, it was for a while, but no, it's it's a parliamentary system. Okay. Um, but effectively, you know, the 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 two largest parties are competing for the prime ministership, right? And so, right, right. Uh, like it's hard to imagine here that yeah. Trump gets elected if it's a if it's parliamentary. Like if it's yeah. you know if like he would not if we had a prime minister instead of a president, I don't think he gets elected. Yeah. Because he's not, he, he wasn't playing, you know, he, he wouldn't have sort of built a coalition or anything. Um, yeah. But, it, which yeah. is, which is part of the intelligence that you need and, and, and why Netanyahu, you know, is seen by many as unbeatable is because he can form these coalitions and then and make them work somehow and make deals. Yeah. And, yeah. and it takes a yeah. lot of intelligence and social intelligence and manipulation and a, a little bit of corruption probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, to even make that work. Um, okay, listen, let's, let's put politics aside. Okay. I think I, okay, I, I sure. could talk to you all day about this, but uh, and 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 I and I do think it's a it's a design conversation. Actually, I do think well, that it is, and I mean it's related to uh, it's definitely related to consulting and and, and building products and yeah. business because yeah. the same factors are at play. They're just so like they're on this weird stage in politics. Yeah. yeah. Someone asked me uh, who is the most 
impactful designer of all time. And I said Montesquieu, uh, who, who's the French um, philosopher who invented the separation of powers into uh, executive, judicial, and uh, oh. legislative. Um, oh, that's a design. Man. That's a design. Yeah, it's a design decision. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's a good answer. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I wish people thought about design and sometimes, um, this is not going at all according to plan, but, uh, <laughs> but whatever, S- sometimes I'm, um, I, I, like, I wish people un- kind of saw design in this broader way. Uh, and so when, when, you know, sometimes I hear you say, okay, it's, it's called design sprint, but it's, it's not just design, it's business and strategy. And I'm like, yeah. but that's what design is, right? Like, yeah. I wish people, yeah. I, I want to reclaim the word design and say, design is much, much bigger than you think, you know, than what most yeah. people think, right? Yeah. The problem is that for every effort to reclaim it, there's so much, there's so much like design is creativity like bs being like pumped out of other pipes like you you can't yeah. you can't pump enough design is just problem solving design is just design is like you know the separation of powers like you can't you need the biggest pipe ever to like pump that out to change the definition of design because there's so many other pipes pumping out like you know just like rainbow colored like goo that's just <laughs> you know like oh let's but you know, what, rainbow I know. colored like, goo. I like that. <laughs> um, and like, I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, it's yeah. such a good picture. <laughs> it's like social media, like, oh, look what we can do in Figma. Like, you know. yeah, I mean, I you know that's which is fine. Like, it's all fine, and, and it's it. I think it's where it's frustrating is when you're like, man, th- this this way of looking at things or this way of like breaking things down, it's so much better than the default way that things happen. Like this, this more like structured way or like this intentional way and saying yeah. like, wait a second, the, the way that we do X, it, it does, it could be better. And let's, let's consider a new structure for it. Let's redesign that thing. And yeah. when, when you're in those, when you're on that edge of like looking at everything through this context of like design and, and you just want to like solve it in the most practical, pragmatic way, it's so frustrating for people, for people to, to try, you know, to put you into like a design, like, Oh no, you're in this like cube. Like you do this little part at the end or whatever. Yeah. It's so frustrating and aggravating. And, you know, so, yeah, so it's, so it, so it sucks, but you know, I guess we just, I, I think it's, it's maybe actually easier to like explain what you do in a different way, you know, and yeah. try not to use, try not yeah. to use design. We tried to, I, I, like I, in I, the book I, sprint, there's like very few mentions of the word design because yeah. I think that's like a, it's probably like a losing battle to redefine it or it's going to take a super long time. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I respect that. Uh, I don't think I'm going to go that path because I, um, and it's all semantics. Like who cares? It's just a word. (laughs) So from that point, I kind of, whatever. It's a very powerful word though. I mean, it is like very powerful because the idea is like you're, you're intentionally setting out a plan for how things should go. And that's, I don't know of another word besides design that, you know, that really does, says that. And the best, um, the best definition I, read of, of design uh, that uh, is starting to really shape my thinking is um, de- design is just um, nonverbal thinking. It's, it's, it's a kind of thinking that's more visual and, and richer than, than words. And uh, that connects to, with me so much with like also systems thinking and, and thinking about complexity and thinking about and problem solving when you're doing this, not from a place of like, let me talk about this and let me throw words at this, but yeah, let yeah. me model this massive thing with all of its interrelationship and try to understand it and try to understand where the levers are. Um, and uh, is it levers or levers? Or I, Well, it probably depends. I say lever, okay. but it's probably lever in like more, you know, the United Kingdom or something. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Um, Good. So I didn't just ask. I I didn't. I wasn't just. Uh, okay. And it wouldn't be like it's not an embarrassing one anyway. It's not yeah. like uh, yeah, yeah. It doesn't say. It doesn't sound super pretentious. Right. <laughs> okay. Good. Lever. Good. <laughs> so I started a, a couple of episodes with this question, um, and 
it could be um it could be a little bit unnatural, but I think it makes a lot of sense to ask. So, you know, obviously, uh-huh. you know, you wrote Sprint and you, do, you, know, and, you know, make time and you do all, you're doing all these amazing things. But I think it's it's worthwhile to go back a little bit, uh, kind of like a Krista Tippett kind of episode. And, uh, <laughs> and, and say, is there, what's something that, that you've believed since childhood, since a, a fairly early age, that is still driving you today. Something that's that's you know oh. really part of your journey throughout all of this. And um, you know, if you need to take your time, think about it. Take your time. Well, I think I, I think I can. I can think of sort of roughly what it is, and then the question is if like I can explain it. But um, I was just visiting my childhood home, actually. Like yesterday, I was there yesterday, and for, we were there for a few days. I grew up on this island that is like kind of right on the edge. It's on, it's in the United States, but it's right on the edge of Canada. Um, mm-hmm. there's, there are these little islands up in Washington state and, um, cool. And I grew up on like a, a farm. And, uh, so I spent a lot of time these last few days, like out in the fields, walking around with my, uh, by myself or with my boys or whatever. And, um, and I, so it's like, it's, you know, when you go back to a place where you were as a kid, right? Like you, it's very powerful. Like the kid, all the kid, like, like brain modes kind of come back. And I definitely feel that really strongly there. And, you know, we're staying in like my childhood bedroom and like, I, you know, have like really, really powerful um, memories. So this thing that, is kind of especially magic for me about being there is this idea of like possibility, you know, like this, this feeling of like being a kid and, um, and like, like I was, I was in the, I was in the field with my younger son and we've been playing lately. I convinced him to play these games. Uh, they're like Dungeons and Dragons board games. So he's, my younger son is nine and he, um, I, I don't even really know how to play. I've played like real Dungeons and Dragons, like twice in my life, maybe, but I don't like, and I, I don't really know. I wouldn't know how to do it. Like I wouldn't know how to like set it up and do real Dungeons and Dragons with my family, but is assuming they would do it, which they probably wouldn't, but, um, but I have managed to get him to play the, but it, it, for me, it's like a really powerful, like I did play it as a kid and I had like the books and I was like wanting to play and like reading yeah. all about it. And, and it became this powerful, like this thing, this idea of like the possibility yeah. or like the, you know, the, the, all the things you could imagine or create this idea of like creating a world, creating the rules, like, like, mm. you know, all these, these things that happen. Connects with Tolkien. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. And it, it was just so, there was so much powerful, like, I don't know, like magic there. There's like a lot of, there's like a lot of like brain energy that's really exciting about that. And I, I, so I, I've been, like I said, lately here at home in Seattle, we've been playing this, this board game and the best one we've gotten so far is called Tomb of Annihilation. And it's based on a uh, Tomb of Horrors, which is referenced in Ready Player One, which is an old dungeon from Dungeons and Dragons. Anyway, so it's getting super, super nerdy. Sorry, you just lost. Ready All Player One. No, 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 no. no gone. I'm on board, on board. So, so Tomb of Annihilation it is like their updated version of Tomb of Horrors. You, I think you can do it as like a regular dungeon, but mm-hmm. they also have this box game. And, and uh, the it's not the best designed board game, the, the way they do these board games, it was pretty good. And it has these little miniatures of the monsters and like your characters and stuff. And we have, we have a good time. So we've been playing that. And anyway, we were out in the field and like, we we're like, okay, let's, I was, I was remembering how when I was a kid, one of the most fun things was to like go through the woods or go through the field and like carry a stick and like imagine that, you know, we're in space and we're having like, we're like, you know, like got like, you know, like sort of laser guns or something or we're, um, or I'm like, you know, it's like a, it's like a dungeon age, Dungeons and Dragons kind of thing, whatever. I've got a sword, whatever, like that stuff was, it's like a middle earth kind of a thing. That was yeah. so fun to like be in the space and just like pretend. And so yeah. I got, I got my, my son into it and we were like, you know, like picking up different sticks. I'm like this stick is, you know, it's like a fire, it's like a fire sword. This stick is, can shoot, you know, like uh, can shoot magic arrows or whatever. Like, and then like we go up to like these dead, 
trees and like smash them with the, it was just, you know, we just we had a great time. And it, but the, the essence of that, the essence behind that magic of being a kid, it's like, it's, it's like creating something that isn't there. It's like, uh, it's, it's sort of, um, it, it, it's, it's just sort of like making something. And in a way that's when I come alive the most is when I'm, when I'm making something. And I, I did so many projects making things as a kid and, uh, I would give a lot of credit to my mom for this because she really f- fostered and encouraged like either whatever I was into, like if I was into s- s- certain kind of books, like she would read them aloud to me like tirelessly. Mm-hmm. Or if, you know, um, I was into like castles and she like got this book and we made a castle together out of like cardboard and paper and, and, um, and like glue and, and, you know, like what, like whatever the thing was, she was, you know, I, I would, I would make up these stories and I'd record them on like a little like voice recorder with a little tape. <laughs> I did the same thing. That's so really? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. my mom would type them up. I, like, so, so then I could see like, Oh, this is the book. Like, this is the story. And those, that and then eventually I was making computer games. I would like make com- games on the computer, and it was all it's all the same like mode of like possibility and like creating yeah. something out of nothing. And and it's I think it's like a I, I don't think this I don't know that this is true for everyone. I only know it's true for me. For me, that feeling of creating something is so powerful and so feels so good and like feels like a like, I don't know, like the idea that I might create something and then sh- especially if there's a way to like share it with someone else, it's like, it's really exciting. And I, uh, I think it's like, when I think about now, like being a, 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 a dad, like, I think it's, it's such a difficult thing to preserve. It's, it seems like, mm-hmm. it seems like it's easy for the world to crush that out because the world has school. The way school works is like, follow all these rules, like check off all these boxes, do yeah. get pretty good at every subject, you know, like, um, it's, it's stupid. And yeah. the more like we're doing school over video and, and I get to sort of watch what goes on all the time. I'm horrifying. Like, why do we yeah. do this? Yeah, yeah, why yeah, yeah. are we doing this to ourselves? And, and more thinking like, how do I encourage the, the joy and the possibility? But anyway, I think that that's that idea of like the joy of creating things and wanting to like, wanting to break down the barriers that keep people from being able to create stuff. That is a big through line for me. And it's, it's goes into sprint eventually, like it goes into building products because building products for me was like, it was so fun when I was a kid to make stuff and to be in that world of possibility. And then you get into working with teams and it's like, wow, the, the potential possibility is huge because if you're working with a team and you're working with a big company, like you can, you can make something big and distribute to so many people. Yeah. But the obstacles and the headwinds and all of those stupid compartments, just like they exist in schools and like, they just get like, they're everywhere. And it's so frustrating. And like Sprint is kind of a reaction to trying to figure out how to break through those things. And, you know, and make time is like kind of a rea- yeah. is kind of about trying to create possibility and like in a day, in day to day life when, you know, it's, it's like, it's hard. Like everything is sort of, there's so many things that resist that. And you, for me, it's like, I have, I feel like my life, I'll be trying to figure out how to, how to fight it and, and, um, and not fight it in a way, at least though, that, that like tears me down at the same time, because you can also fight things so hard that you just like, you don't have any chi left. You're just out of energy. Like, um, so yeah, that's, yeah. Anyway, that's what I think. That's what I think. Super, super interesting. Um, so I, I mean, a lot of it, um jives with my experience um the experience the the childhood experience of of possibility grew up in a small town also with very few um distractions or you know it's it was all in my imagination and playing with friends um but it also reminds me what what you just said about you know you're kind of bashing with the with the walls of reality this is a famous quote from uh from steve jobs um, oh, I don't know it. What, what... Where he basically, um, oh, I wish I could find it, but uh, it's a, it's on YouTube. So, um, but he's he's saying basically most people live as if like the walls of reality that are made by other people are like just part of reality, and you know, uh, 
I've always, you know, if, if there's one thing I wish to convey to people is like, you know, everything in the world is made, is made by people no smarter than you <laughs> and everything can be changed and everything like this, essentially seeing the world of possibilities. Oh, here, I found it. I found it online. I, um, I, I Googled it. Uh, nice. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and your life is just to live your life inside the world. Try not to bash into the walls too much. Try to have a nice family life, have fun, save a little money. That's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact. Everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. Once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. That's a good one. Yeah. It's one of my favorites. That's the Goodreads version of it. I don't know if that's if that's uh, accurate. Yeah, no, I mean, there's... quotes on the internet. I, I I learned when writing books that like you can't trust a quote on the internet <laughs> unless you can find the primary source. There's so many things that are like Abraham Lincoln said, and then it's like, no, wait a second, like that. Yeah. Did he really say that? That seems a little like if you you know you can kind of like a lot of times you kind of if you if you just look for a second, you're like that doesn't quite seem like the. Sometimes it's like that doesn't seem like the right sort of sentence structure for that era or whatever. So possibility is a really interesting thing. And it's also interesting that you um, you take it into these places um, like Microsoft and Google. Um, and then when you find that there's a limits to possibility in those places, you 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 just you keep pushing because you you've experienced enough possibility in your childhood like you feel like that should be possible it should be possible to do certain things yeah that makes it sound i guess more heroic than it i mean <laughs> because the reality was is that i arrived in those places and i was like so like excited to have these jobs and like so i felt so like oh man i work at microsoft like cool but then i was also like really intimidated by the way everybody did everything and i just assumed that it was I mean, that the Steve Jobs quote is very accurate. Like I've assumed it's done this way for a very smart reason. And I just tried my best for years to conform. Like, how do I get along and do my small part in a way that is fun for me? And that still does have a through line to like creating things and that feeling of possibility. But, but how do I how do I like, what are the, what are the rules here? Like so much of life it, from the time you're born, it's like kind of trying to figure out like what goes on here? What are the rules? How do I make my way or like survive, you know, um, in this, in, in where to, whatever place I'm in. And it's, I think it's part of why we like, you know, we like books so much. We like this experience of going into a character's head and then seeing how they, you know, especially if they go into a new, you know, there's a sort of like this saying that most stories are like a stranger came to town or, uh, oh God, what's the, what's the summary? This is not, I won't look it up, but there's like a stranger came to town or we all took a journey or something. They're like the two, like the, like many, many stories boil down to like that, that mm. essence. Yeah. Yeah. And, there's like 12 archetypes or something. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and like both of those, like a stranger came to town or like, we all went on a journey. They both involve like learning about a, a new world. And, and when you learn about a new world, you're trying to figure out the rules and you're trying to understand how it works. And then in a story, in a book, everything clicks together eventually and it all fits and it all works. And then the, the heroes like somehow they move through and succeed. And that's what we all want. We want to like figure out the rules from the time you're a baby to like you go to school to like you go to work to you're trying to figure out the rules and then succeed in some way or survive or whatever. And like that's so that's what I was doing most of the time, just trying to like figure out the rules. And I don't know what happened eventually, I guess it, it, it was that that notion of like, huh, like maybe I started to see things that that other people were doing and things that, and moments where I had broken the rules and it worked. And, and I, and I, I, and I was encouraged by different things. Like a thing that was a huge deal to me was reading getting real by 37 signals. And that came out in 2006. Hmm. And I read that book and I was like, I can't even remember how I found out about it, but 
when I read it, I was like, whoa, what? Like, cause they were just tearing down everything about the way we did business. Yeah. Like any business did business building software. And like, man, is that the book that like, became rework later? Or? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so yeah. good. Yeah. It's so good. And it was like, it was like, well, damn, this, I was, th this was just like, like I started to see everything differently, you know? And I guess I started to see those things as walls and tunnels and not, and not like the perfect system, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it wasn't like middle earth that I should try to figure out and survive in. It was like, why wow, this is just stupid. Like some right. of these things just don't make sense. But it, it took a really long time to go from reading that. Like a lot of things, in business books or whatever, like you come across a good idea. It's, it's really hard to put those into practice because, you know, I wasn't in charge, you know, we're not in charge <laughs> yeah. of, of most of these systems. So, um, so it took a while to go from like, to to, to shift from like, totally just like, let me follow your rules and be the best uh, employee I can be to like, wait a second, the rules are weird. And like, maybe being the best employee I can be, or like, maybe I don't, when I see what success looks like here, like that's not success for me. And then like actually trying to actively do something different and it was a long process. Interesting. It's so interesting. So, um, yeah, my experience is, is, is quite different in, I, I never really worked for corporate America or corporate anything. Yeah. I always worked for startups until we got acquired once. And I just like, we got acquired by Motorola in 2012 and I hated it. Like I, uh, that was the first time I even was in a company that's bigger than 20 yeah. people. And I hated it so much. Um, and um, and it, it, it does feel like, because um, when I read Rework, I, I thought, oh, this is so good, this is so right. But like most of it is how the people I admired in startups worked. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't this clash. And then, um, but it, it, so it sounds like what you took this kind of vision and you tried to find a way to bring about the change, at least in the creative process, where it's kind of works like a startup inside uh, of a big company. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, it's true. And it's, it's like, it, in, it ends up being being a very startup -y way to work. Um, but the genesis of it was, I think it was like reading things that suggested that the conventional wisdom is, is not all that wise and re uh, uh, getting real was a huge one. And then, um, another book I read that, I mean, all, all the, all the books that sort of started to like break down my, my, my model, which was figure out what other people are doing. So I didn't, okay. So I didn't study design. I'd studied art and, and I just had always been making computer games and interested in like making web pages and like interested in that. Mm. But when I came in to, to work as a designer, uh, my first job was at Oakley, the sunglasses company. And I was making like Nice. animated gifts at first, like ads. And then, <laughs> uh, and then I made, and then I did like, I started to do web design there for their shopping, um, websites. And then, and then I went to Microsoft and was you know, like a very junior designer, but in both those contexts, like I didn't really, I knew how to use the tools. Um, and like, I had this sort of sense from doing it of how to design products, but I hadn't, I hadn't studied it. So I just assumed like everybody else knows something I don't know. Cause they like, at the very least a person, other people who were, you know, my, my peers who, you know, were, were, had, were starting with the same amount of experience as me had studied this stuff and they like kind of knew how, I mean, nobody, although nobody studied, I was lucky cause nobody had studied like HCI, um, you yeah. know, nobody had said like human computer interaction or like anything like that. They were, they'd studied like graphic design maybe, but even those people, I was like, well, they know something about design. Like I'm just kind of making up what seems right to me. And this was like, this was like really reinforced my sense of follow the rules at first. And, uh, yeah. And so getting real, but also like getting things done by David Allen, like that book made me start thinking about my own, my own schema inside my brain being mm. like, maybe not right. And I, you know, and I would say now, like, I don't think his is totally right either necessarily, but it does sort of like it, it it was sort of the first thing maybe that started to shake up 
the way that I naturally think about doing things might not be yeah. right. It's a, it's a systemic way, right? It, for me, yeah. it was the first time someone thought about, hey, everyday life activities in a way that's systemic and fits together and you can see the, the logic of it. And yeah. so, yeah, you understand if you take out the, I don't know, the weekly review, some, you know, it all falls apart. Everything is needed. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't yeah. mean that yeah. it's the one solution. It's just. Right, right, right. But it's a system and it's designed. It's a designed yeah. system. Yeah. And, um, and then this other book that was really influential to me, it was made to stick, which isn't really about designing things so much, but again, it's about like, it shows the way that things break down in a way that things are stupid. And another one was brain rules. That was a uh, impactful book for me that was, it's about like um, some of the, it's just, it was sort of like a summary of brain research uh, and, and what we know about the brain and how like part of it was about how the way we present information and the way we, you know, the way we work like is counter to what works well for our brains. Mm. And so th these things were all kind of just like started, I guess started making me think like, Oh, huh, maybe conventional wisdom isn't right. And so that was at odds. There was just this tension, but it wasn't like, then I had this like bolt of inspiration. It took a really long time to like live with that tension um, before, before really like starting to, starting to actively think about redesigning it. Mostly it was just, it would so happen that this project would get under pressure. And then finally I'd like have to somehow steal away and just focus on doing design work, like just focus on drawing or whatever um, for, you know, for three days or just, you know, um, steal away with two other people on the project and just like hash out what we're going to, what we're going to do and come up with some kind of a prototype. And those mm. things were like some of the most powerful seeds for the design sprint, but they only came through like those were just like the pressure release valves where I like went back to that mode of possibility and that mode of like creating and like yeah. just doing it yeah. and not negotiating constantly or not going to meetings constantly. Yeah. Like, but, but it's, but it's interesting because if that thing wasn't there, then you would probably quit and try to change profession or, you know, but you had the sense that it was possible and you were like, let's just get together and do this. Like, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Right. That's true. That's true. That sense that it was possible was there. And I remember yeah. one, one thing that was really powerful for me was uh, we were, I was working on Microsoft Encarta. This is this encyclopedia on CD-ROM. By the way, great product. I oh, was thank you. so yeah, into yeah. it as a, as a young teenager, I guess. Uh, I think that it was, it was great. And I, I do, so exciting. Uh, I do mourn it a little bit because, uh, Wikipedia yeah. is just, you know, Wikipedia is much more broad, but it's, it's not as good. I don't think that the, the articles are as good. I just think like, um, just even thinking back to a time where like how excited I was when we got in Carta, um, because the whole idea, the whole premise of an encyclopedia doesn't hold anymore in the internet in a yeah. way. Like even yeah. Wikipedia. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like the idea from the like 18th century of like, let's organize all of human knowledge in books. Yeah. And it will be yeah. authoritative, like all of human knowledge. And now we have the internet and it makes any encyclopedia look ridiculous. Like, you know. Yeah. And we have this like ongoing crisis about what is knowledge what is tr truth and reality because right. it's all there and how do you how can you tell and i think it was one thing that's interesting about encarta is it's like this dying gasp of saying no like this is the facts like th right. this is the body of knowledge and we were like stretching to the max because we knew wikipedia was going to always have more so it's like how can we encompass as much as possible and say that it's true, but really have it be true. Whereas like with Wikipedia, I feel like you always have crap in there. Like there's no, it's a very smart system, but there's, there's just so much, there's so much crap in there. Like if yeah. you, um, and like the, like there's a Wikipedia article about design sprints and it's just, I read it and I'm like, Oh, like this is not, it's not accurate. Like, you know, but you can so edit like, it. You can fix it. No, just, I get, yeah, I know. I, I know, I know. No, you can't, if it's your own thing, I don't think, I don't think you, I think they would probably, I don't know. And I also don't care <laughs> enough. I care. I obviously I care enough that I brought it up, but I don't care enough to do anything about it. But the, um, the man, 
but yeah, so what we're talking about, oh yeah, Encarta. So there's this moment where Encarta is, okay, they're coming out with Windows, um, oh man, what was it called? Vista is what it called when it launched. I think of it as Longhorn, because that's what we called it inside Microsoft. It was called Longhorn was the code name. And it was going to be this big revolutionary shift, you know, where like Windows XP uh, was built on the same foundation that went back to like Windows 95. It, they were like redoing the code base. It was going to be like a, it felt like it was going to be a, as big of a deal as like, you know, Mac OS 10. only a much bigger deal because of course in those days, like Mac was like this little, had had been relegated to this little niche product. Yeah. And uh, although I was, a, I was a Mac user sort of throughout, but the, they, so they, they're building Windows Longhorn and there's this idea that they're going to be these sort of flagship products. And one of the, one of the things that we're going to do is make Encarta like a, a, a version for Longhorn for Windows Vista. That's, that's just, you know, beautiful showcase for um, how amazing Windows Vista is. And so I'm really bummed because it's like, I, I've been working on this or like a few other designers working on Encarta and the other designers all get to work on the new fancy one. And I'm still working on like the old, like the, you know, so they're working on the like two years out one and I'm working on the like next year's just iteration of our same old product. Mm -hmm. Um, But it turns out to be kind of cool because, you know, I get to have a little bit more um, say in what we build. And then what happens is that, uh, they they find out that Longhorn is going to be pushed out even another year. So there's going to the year that they thought they were going to be able to do this big fancy new version of Encarta, and they were going to get all this help from like the Windows team, is not going to happen. And they have to re they have to like redesign do something with Encarta in that year. And so I'm like I now know how the old thing works, and I have these ideas. And so I like sketch this stuff, and like I get to pitch it to the the VP, who to me is like basically like, you know, a deity. And I'm like, here's my idea. You know, I'm just like, I'm like, you know, I'm like 20, I don't know, three or something. And I'm just like, now it seems like, sure, people like run companies at that age, but I just felt so intimidated. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, here's all this stuff that I, you know, sort of thought through. And it was all kind of hand drawn. And like, and it was, that was like the first moment where I, and and she went for it, you know, and she was like, yeah, like, well, cool, let's, let's do this. And, and I got to lead that project. So, I'm wondering, like, and and later I may ask you to give you your your uh, latest definition of of the sprint, but um, but for now I just I'm wondering, like, when did it become a thing? Uh, because and it's a weird thing to say, but um, the main thing about the sprint, like to me, the main innovation about the sprint is that it is a thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're right. You know what I'm saying? That's I do, and that's a really interesting observation. I hadn't thought about that, but as you were saying, like, when did it become a thing? I was thinking, like, well, at first, that's all it was was a thing. Like, it was, you know, it started as a thing, and that was the that is probably that is the central key to it is that it's a thing. It was um, so the like leading up to it, I don't know, I could talk about it for any amount of time. Maybe I'll skip that. There, there's there's things that happen leading up to it that kind of like put various parts of these these thoughts in my head. Mm. But but basically what happened was I I thought, okay, we have we have like um this problem at Google I can see right now. This is in 2010. Um where there are there are a lot of like cool projects, but I had been in Google for like three years, and I could tell that it the the way that things happened or the reasons why some things happened and some things didn't happen it wasn't really necessarily a good reason. it was just sort of what happened and like there were projects that should not have happened that did, and there were projects that like really Google should. Plus. And, and yeah Google plus I mean this is before that ha- this is like at the beginnings of that happening. Okay. Um, but you know, uh, Google, I think Google wave had happened and like, <laughs> um, you know, there were just like, there, there were dumb things. Already. You know, you, you know, I was, uh, one of my Halloween costumes was uh, Google wave. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> I, swore, did you, uh, I wore, I think I had a t-shirt with the wave logo 
No, okay. no, no. I had the T-shirt with the Google logo, which I got from a friend who worked for Google, and then I did the Wave logo uh, in makeup on my face. <laughs> anyway, that is such a, I, yeah, that that dorky is a very interesting example. No, it's, well, it's great. It's great. Yeah, it is dorky, but also great. But that product is a, well, it's a tan. That's a tangent, but like it definitely epitomizes a lot of the. A lot of the thing, it's like, it's not one I think people will jump to as like the example of Google doing something stupid because there are so many like better ones since mm -hmm. then, like, um, like Google Plus and Google Glass. But it's, it is like, it really does have these key elements of like a, you have like an executive who's super excited about a technology and that executive is, um, is thought of as a genius by the founders. and. And so is just given sort of a blank check to the mandate to do this thing. And then there's like no thought because this person, because this person has that trust for whatever reason, it was, it's different reasons in different cases, but because this person has that trust in this case, because they, they had been the founders of um, keyhole, which became maps and was really successful. Mm -hmm. Then there's like no, there, there's no sense of like, will there be product market fit for this? It's just like, no, there will, because the technology is great and this person's great. Therefore, this right. will be great. Right. And I'm, I'm sure there are examples where that works out. And, but I think it actually doesn't usually work out. And it, it's amazing that smart people f like screw that up so much. And, and you know, um, it's so costly. And it happens time and time again with companies. Yeah. There's executives who have that thing. And I think, you know, whatever it is, they, we talked about at the beginning, politicians, and if they have that thing that people like, you know, and, and if and in, inside a company, a big company, executives need to have a certain thing that like the CEO goes for, I think. Yeah. If, the, if they have the thing that the CEO goes for, then they can get away with murder and they, they can get away with horrible ideas and horrible things. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it wastes so many people's time, years of people's lives. You know, it's, it, I mean, there are much sadder things in the world than like, if you worked on Google Wave. Yeah, a bunch like, of Googlers but, wasting a couple of years making yeah, right? a that's lot not, of money. That's not that yeah. sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, on the, you know, but then again, like on the scale of the whole planet, like all of the time that's wasted on stupid yeah. stuff and yeah. also all the things that are made. The alternative that uses like, that they, you could have yeah, with that, that time. Could, yeah. yeah, and the stuff that, that does make it out there and that people do end up using that's garbage because people, it's this force of personality or it's like we just don't, I don't know. It's I, I, I believed I believed in Google Wave until I used it. Like I mean, I the the pitch was really exciting until I actually got. What was the pitch? I mean, I guess it was like was it like Slack? Well, no, it was like like essentially. I'm trying to remember, but it was essentially email, but real time. Uh, so lots of people are right. in the same conversation, and everyone, and you can all kind of. It's almost like. Um, an ethereal uh, Slack, like you're creating a Slack yeah. just by starting a conversation. Right. Uh, and it was right. before the age of like Messenger and WhatsApp and, and iMessage and all that stuff. Um, so it before you saw it, before you tried to use it, I thought I thought it was, um, I was curious about it. And, and yeah. I was very happy to get an invite. And then, um, yeah, but then I, try, I used it once and I was like, what is this for? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, and it had that element of like, you're like, you could see what the person was typing, which is just, yeah. you know, like, I mean, you know, and people would use that inside Google and they're like, God, this is terrible. Like, I don't want people to see what I'm typing while I'm thinking about it. Like that's, and, and yet like nobody, you know, they, the, the boss wouldn't listen, you know, and like, this is, so this is like, yeah, anyway, it, there were things there. It, so the context was there were things that were, more i was more interested in actually the things that were could be i thought really cool and it was really hard to get them going um because there were a lot of those this notion of 20 percent time at google meant that there were a lot of like really interesting projects and i had worked on in the couple of years prior to that i'd worked on two of those that i thought were really cool and i had seen how hard it was to get them going one of them was pri became priority inbox in gmail and it's this this tool to use machine learning to to sort of filter 
yeah, like like organize the good stuff in your email. Hopefully, I, I, I used it. Uh, I used it until I started using Superhuman. Um, it's you know, it's it's still yeah. good. It's still great. I wish Superhuman used it actually. Like I use Superhuman, and I I do miss like when I go back to use Gmail, I'm like, oh yeah, that is nice to have it like divided into those. To me, it's nice to have it divided into those two chunks. But mm. yeah, in Superhuman, you can move so fast that it almost doesn't matter. But, but no, um, isn't isn't it like the important tab, isn't it the same as the important section in Priority Inbox? It's not using the same marking? Oh, that's a good question. I think it is. I, yeah, I should take a look at that. I, um, I was under the impression that it was using something else. But um, yeah, if it does, I'm sold. Anyway, it's, it's, it's good. It's good tech. And I think it was a good idea. And, um, and we, to, to take that from like this, it was an engineer's uh, 20% project to take that to like something we were going to build um, me and this engineer, like she and I basically ran like what were sort of like four design sprints, like each week coming up with a design, building a prototype, and in this case, we launched it to like a bunch of Googlers who would, would then their email was using this sort of, she would like kind of hack the, um, the front end for this, this build uh, so that it, it used the design we were testing. And, um, and, and that was sort of this thing that unblocked this thing, like, un, like, like sort of like launched it into like, oh, okay, this could make sense. We got something we had confidence in to build. Mm. And then the same thing with what is now Google Meet, where it was like one week of time, um, me and a couple of other folks who'd been working on this 20%, we'd been working on this 20% project together and we had been working on it for years. And then when we got together for a week and made a prototype and put it in people's hands, then everything changed. And so my thought was like, okay, it'd be really cool to, to use that tool to sort to, to use some kind of a focused effort to get things going. Mm. And I'd been exposed to, I'd, I had facilitated some design thinking workshops and been taught how to do that. Like when I came to Google and those were, there was something really powerful about convening people and having a structure, mm. but I'd also seen that those like didn't, they didn't stick. They didn't like hold the momentum. Those, they didn't end with a prototype there. Mm. You know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't totally confident in all the activities that we did in those design thinking workshops. And, and so anyway, in the beginning, I sat down with Irene Al, who was, she was the head of design at Google. And I said, like, look, I, I want to, I want to take this job of working as, um, as a design manager for the Seattle and Kirkland offices. This is this, you know, in Washington state, um, which is where I live back where I live now. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and my idea to manage these teams was I was going to run the design sprint. And I remember sitting down with, I remember first like going to this coffee shop by my house and like kind of jotting down like roughly some notes about what I thought this thing could be. And then basically saying to her, like, here's this idea for this thing. I'll call it a design sprint. And like, I'll recruit, I'll use some of the designers from our team and, you know, I'll recruit people from elsewhere in the company. Cause I knew a lot of designers. I knew pretty much everybody at that point. And, and we'll, we'll spend a week with a team when they're starting something off. And there was this shortage of designers at Google. And so, so that seemed like, like I was able to, you know, and she was like, yeah, like I didn't have, you know, I didn't have the details yet, but as a thing, like, as like a thing, she was like, yeah, like I could, she's, she's like, well, I'll give you a shot to do this. And which was a huge deal. Right. Cause I had like no evidence really. And, um, and relatively like the, I think up to that point I had worked on projects that were hard in terms of like, like politically like getting teams that maybe were difficult or like multiple locations or starting those 20% projects, they were hard, but compared to other designer, like product designers at Google, I hadn't done anything that was particularly impressive. And so like, like looking back now, I can say, Oh, well that, you know, that thing became Google meet and that's now a real product that Google is trying desperately to make people use instead of zoom. Yeah. Um, but, but like at that time it was just still something we were using internally and only like just barely. And it was like really geeky still at that point. And so she definitely took a chance on me being able to do it. Um, and uh, which is, was huge. And then from then on, it was just like selling the idea of, yeah, like of the thing. Sorry, I just talked for like two hours about your question about what's Super, like super thing, interesting. But, but that's, I think, the, that's the essence of it. So, so if I, because really like, so I, I, we're going to kind of 
maybe try to reverse engineer some of these things, but uh, in the sprint, but the um, the <laughs> the idea that you're all exposed to all of these different projects and they really needed some design discipline and some design work and um and it needed to be a thing because you needed a thing for all of these different like you know because you're going into these situations and you needed it and you started developing it and you're like oh it's going to be a thing that i use again and again is that how it kind of grew so it was so at this point you're not thinking this is going to be a world changing thing no it's no but my I did, thing yeah i did think okay that this could be a google changing thing i remember that was my hope hmm. like my ambition was i want to create a, a method for google to start big projects because hmm. they don't have that Mm. And I knew that by that point, I was like, well, I've worked at Microsoft for many years. I had worked there for like five or six years. I've worked at Google now for, I don't know, it was like three or four years at that time. And I'd worked at Oakley and Oakley was like a weird, a weird organization and a diff very different kind, not a software company, but you know, but like a pretty big company. And it was clear to me that like the recipe everybody used for starting big projects was chaos. Like that was that, like, it was, you know, there was no formal thing that we did. And, and, um, hmm. and I was like, well, there could be actually something really good at the beginning of starting a project. Like yeah. not only is there not like nothing, but like it could actually be good. And I've seen things happen. I've seen moments in work that were really good. So hmm. how could I create those? And I knew that from working on the Gmail team, I felt like I was finally working with like a really, a really high performing, like, it was me and two other designers. Um, the other two were Braden Coetz, who uh, would go on to be the first venture partner at, um, at Google Ventures and co-author on the book. And uh, he also designed, like, this is just kind of a fun fact about him. He designed this, um, this app for a startup that his friend who was another, an engineer from, uh, from Gmail left Google and started. And I thought, oh man, I want to say it was called Beluga, but I'm not sure that's right. But Facebook acquired it and it's what messenger is based off of. Um, and so it's like, he, he's a, Braden is an amazing designer. Hmm. Um, he, Michael Leggett, who would go on to be like the lead Gmail designer and then, um, left he he designed inbox he was the he sort of like found co-founded the product google inbox and then mm. went to go work at facebook and led the was working on the um you know the messenger team and he was so so these are like really really good designers and we had a great product manager team and um it felt like very high performing work and i felt like i was seeing decisions made with like in smart ways. And I, so I, I, I did feel like some confidence that we, you know, like we could like bring some of that goodness. Like I thought even within mm. Google, like Gmail is a pretty well-performing team, but I know we don't have, we don't have a great way of starting these new projects. We're kind of trying to figure it out when we do it. And if, and, and so I guess I had enough confidence that like, nobody has something like this. There's good stuff out there. And if I could create a, if I could could offer this to Google. This could, this could make, I thought, you know, naively maybe now I would say, but like, I thought I can make the world better because there, there are, uh, there's really cool potential mm. inside of Google. There's a lot of possibility here. And this process could, this, if we had a way to start projects so that the interesting ideas actually made it, they actually got the momentum they need. That would be good for, the, that would be good for the world. Like I, you know, I, I believed in the the Kool. -Aid. I drank the Kool Aid, the Google Kool Aid, and I thought yeah. this would be like really powerful. And so that was the that was the idea, was to sort of unlock more of the potential of Google. And uh, it did not occur, definitely did not occur to me then that it would be useful outside of Google. I mean, I wasn't even sure if it would work inside of Google. Hmm. Um, but yeah, no, and it turned out to change. Uh much more than Google. So many companies now. Well, I mean, I would say that it's, I would say that it's both more and less successful than I'd hoped because it, it did like it has not, I don't think it's changed Google. Like I don't mm. think it has fundamentally changed that 
the way big projects are started there. I might be wrong because I'm, mm. yeah, it's been a long time since I've been inside there, but just anecdotally, like I think that they've embraced it. I think it, it as an idea is stuck around and they've done an excellent job of, they've trained lots of people to facilitate. I know they do lots of sprints, yeah. but I don't know that it happens in the beginning with the leadership mm. in the way that, we were able to do it in the first days and in the way that I had like really hoped it would happen. I hoped it would change that dynamic of like, Oh, we're just going to trust this VP to like go do this thing or whatever. Um, I don't know if it actually has changed that. Mm. And I don't know, you know, that's, that's what I want. I would like to see people fundamentally change the way they, they make decisions and fundamentally change the way they work together mm. from the get go when it's really important, you know, yeah. not when it's sort of convenient, but yeah. it has been more versatile and more sticky than certainly than I ever would have thought. I mean, you do, maybe you didn't completely change uh, Google, but you completely changed Lego. And, <laughs> and you can yeah, yeah, accident. You know. Yeah, right. By accident, which is actually what way cooler to me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, and there's other companies that I think are are a very very sprint heavy, um, and all the big companies are running sprint sale at least occasionally. Yeah. At critical yeah, moments, yeah. and I and I still I I think it's still really early um even though i agree yeah i agree i think you're right about that it has um, a long there's a there's a lot more uh there are a lot more opportunities for sprints to be run than than there are sprints yeah run, for sure i started talking about sprints um you know maybe i mean I, I ran sprints before but maybe started talking publicly about sprints like in the last two years and i've already turned a couple of giant companies into uh like sprint uh running yeah. companies um and 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 it's and it wasn't hard <laughs> like oh i just had yeah. to tell them what it was right and that's awesome uh, that's really awesome so i i feel like um you know it's it's still early and uh but but it's super impressive right so you, you ran it uh with how many dozen companies in Google, uh, projects in Google, and then 150 startups at GV. And then now it's, you know, it's rare to hear of a large company that's not at least exploring sprints or, you know, it's definitely in tech, but um, I'm thinking other areas as well, like banks and. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think, like you said, it's still sort of the early days. So I think a lot of a lot of people are hearing about it for the first time. And something that I saw at, at, when the, when the book came out, it took like, it seems like it took like a year before people, you know, had maybe gotten the book and then they actually had the chance to run a sprint because you can't, you usually can't just go run a design sprint like the next day, you know, like you, you've yeah. got to have, the I project. actually did. I, I actually, yeah. I, I read the book. Um, I was, uh, well, I was the head of product at an agency in New York. Yeah, uh, and yeah. um, I read the book and I um, I called a meeting of the, the heads of the company uh, to say, this is how I want to do this now. And, oh, that's uh, awesome. And literally the head of uh, business development was in that meeting, left to take a call and sold the first sprint that we did. <laughs> That is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, well, that's, that's awesome. But I don't think that's most people's experience. Most people are like, they read it and they're like, okay, I'll, I'll wait. You know, the project has to be at the right point and I have to convince my colleagues or I have to convince the boss or, you know, if they're not the boss, even if they are the boss, like when's the right moment to do this. And so it has this like, you know, like very slow burn before mm -hmm. the first, usually before the first sprint. And then it, it normally, I think it takes like a couple sprints inside an organization before everybody looks at that and says, oh, we can do this here. This mm -hmm. isn't something that like we're, you know, Silicon Valley startups or Google or whatever, but it feels like something we can do here. Mm -hmm. and, and it takes time. So I am hopeful that it will like, it will continue to spread more and more. I, and I have more very more little doubt. I have very little doubt. I am, in fact, betting betting my current career on it. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I, I, I see it as kind of, because um, I've seen this trajectory with like agile and then, you know, kind of lean, lean design yeah. and lean startup yeah. where, you know, there was a book and then people were talking about it for a while. And then after like this, it's like ideas um, 
uh, spreads very slowly through cultures, totally. even, you know, innovative cultures. Um, and, you know, but after, you know, the, the Lean Startup book came out in 2011. By 2015, you couldn't really, you couldn't really try to find a job as a, as a product manager for a startup without n knowing the book by heart, you know? Right, and, right, right, right. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, it takes time, but, I, but, but, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I, I believe it's, uh, it's getting short. So I have this question for you. So, you know, the sprint is obviously, so first of all, maybe if you, what's your current definition for the sprint? When you meet someone like a friend of your wife or someone who doesn't know anyone, anything about you and is like, well, what, what is the sprint thing? What do you tell them? <laughs> if I meet someone in like that kind of context, I usually say it's like a boring business process and you don't, you don't want to hear about it <laughs> because I'm like, I was sort of like most of the time in my real life, I would just rather not talk about it. Like, it's funny. I, I, you know, it's like, like, cause I, I, I know that when I start talking about it, I mean, it's like full on, like, like I geek out, like I can talk about it forever but I'm very well aware that like most, like, I don't think most people really care a whole lot. And I also don't, I don't love talking about, um, you know, Oh, like I, I worked at Google. I worked with startups. I worked in venture capital. Like I, it's fine. Like when that, when everybody already knows, like we've already set the context in this conversation that we're talking about business stuff and then it's fine. Like I'm, yeah. I'm happy to like bring all of that like luggage to the table, but, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to like frame a conversation I have with like, uh, when I have the opportunity to have a conversation with a human being and not yeah. be that person, yeah. I don't want to be that person. I want to like leave that stuff out of it if I can. And, and, you know, and then I'll say, I'll usually say like, if people, if it does, if, if I can't just avoid like, what do you do? Um, I'll use, I'll just, I'll say, like, oh, I'm like, a, I'm mostly a writer these days. And then if they, you know, if they ask what kind of book I write, I'm like, well, like I wrote a, I wrote kind of like a business book that is, you know, was like sort of successful. So I teach, I teach that, um, this sort of business process and give talks about it. And that, that is like most of the time that's the extent of what I say about it. Um, but, uh, but, but if I'm explaining, yeah, if I do have sort of have to explain to somebody, I say like, the idea is like you take, like when you're starting a big project, you take like a, roughly a week of time, like four or five days, you clear the calendar, you get a small group of people together and, um, and you sort of follow this like checklist of activities to go from, from sort of this starting point where you, you just know you're going to start the project to at the end of the week, you've, you've made a prototype of some kind and you're testing it with your customers. Mm. And, um, and that is, I think, I mean, that is the, the core that I've hit in that on most of the core ideas of the sprint. It happens at the beginning. It's, uh, it's a checklist. Um, it, you know, it, it has a prototype and a test. I think the part that that doesn't mention that's really important is the decision-making is very, um, you know, is, is, is very structured mm. and the information sharing is very st structured and, mm. and intentional. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, like, Already, I know that, that that first sentence that I said about it is already like straining the bounds of what most people want to hear. Yeah. And it's not perfect because I know a lot of people hear that and they hear like prototype tests, design sprint. They're just kind of already like putting that into a little compartment of mm -hmm. sort of web design geekery that they don't care about, you know? And, and so, um, hmm. so if I, it depends on then if I'm like, if I'm trying to really like sell somebody on it, you know, who isn't, you know, who's like more of a business person, then I'm talking more about like, look, this is a way for a, like a startup to assess whether they have product market fit for a, a new, a, yeah. a new product, a new feature, some big new initiative. Yeah. And we use this process to, to help a team assess product market fit. And, and then like that's using different keywords to really like try to, to rope activate. in somebody who might have yeah. kind of like put up the shields when they heard design sprint. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. No, I, I think when I talk to investors, I definitely talk about product market fit. When I talk to, 
just people who ask me, what do you do? Yeah. Um, I say, I run this process developed at Google um, t- that takes you from an idea to a prototype, and then you get to even test it with users on the final day. And and uh, that's good. I like how you say and then even like it's kind of cool because it's like it's like almost like the it's like the infomercial. It's like yeah, you yeah. get this, but then you also get this, and yeah. you also get this. All that I like feedback. That a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but people think it's cool when you say like you know. Um, people who have nothing to do with design or startups yeah. get it. They're like, Oh, so you start with an idea and you actually make something happen. Like that's the, yeah. it's a cool transition. Uh, so what are some things? I, so I, now I'm learning that you actually prefer not to tell people what, you know, <laughs> anything about this, which is weirdly makes sense to me knowing you, uh, <laughs> But um, not that not that it actually makes sense. It makes sense from knowing you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I was wondering, what are some clever things you did in the sprint that you wished people more people would appreciate, or more people <laughs> would yeah. like? Because I yeah, look at it yeah. and I find like all these little clever things that not many people are talking about or oh, it yeah. just seemed to work. Um, it's also very, it's kind of sneaky in a way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, all this, uh, yeah. Well, thank you for noticing uh, some of the sneaky things. I, um, I am probably like most pleased with how the decision-making works in the sprint because it's, it's like, it's, it's this, layer that like is woven in throughout the whole process throughout the whole time of the sprint and it's meant to um like short circuit like defuse a lot of bad decision making things that happen but also like but not just do that like it's also more more importantly it builds the right kinds of decisions like it builds the you know gives gives the tools and the context and the structure to create really good decisions. And then the whole thing is really healthy for decision-making because it's this tight loop where the decision is not, is not binding. Like it, you just, you're just making some, some choices for this week and then you test it. And and in so doing you're you're educating the team and in particular the decision maker about about the customer, you're bringing them closer to the customer and giving them like this real sort of connection, hopefully with what they're making and why it matters or doesn't matter to people Mm. uh, so that they can make better decisions next time. And uh, that is like, I, um, I read speaking of books, like there's this book decisive by the Heath brothers who also wrote made a stick. And it's it's a great book. And it actually came out. It's funny because I was talking uh, about this with my co-author John Zaraski the other day. And because I was thinking like, Oh, I think we, um, I think we borrowed a lot of ideas for like, like learned a lot of ideas or stole them from decisive, but it, it actually, I looked at when decisive came out and it came out after we had already like, I'd written the blog posts about the sprint, which have mm-hmm. like the process in it. So I think we just sort of luckily like the, the sprint process happened to evolve to match what turned out to be really good advice on, on decision-making. And I don't think that's because I'm so smart or we're so smart. I think it's just because like when you get the chance to watch people make decisions over and over again, and if your, your primary driver is like, how do we help people make good decisions? You will notice things like people need to have more than one option. They can't make a good decision. If you just say one option, like thumbs up or thumbs down. And they Mm -hmm. need to have like, uh, you need to hear not just like what's good about everything, but you need to have like criticism. You need to have the chance to have competition yeah. and you need to have the chance to try things out. And, you know, and like, all, so all these things are just sort of, I think what any logical, rational person or team would get to if they had the chance to do the same process over and over again. But most people just don't get that chance. It's the most unique thing about the design sprint is that, you know, is that it's a thing. I got the chance with my colleagues to do it's a thing. And I got the <laughs> chance because it's a thing to do it like 200 times and like try to make it better. And most things you don't get the chance to do them 200 times. Yeah. So, um, so that's that. So yeah, the, I mean, decision-making I feel like is like a really big one. There's also some stuff about if you are trying to come up with a solution to a problem, 
And uh, through the lens of like doing design work, I had done this many times as a designer and, and before that as a kid trying to make something. Um, how do you set somebody up to be able to make something? And so in, in the first two days, like the, the map and sketch parts of the sprint, I'm really trying to set somebody up to be able to make something, make a solution. Yeah. And I th- some of that stuff I, th- I, feel, I feel really good about too. Like it always makes me feel good if I'm teaching this sprint and I've got, you know, if there's like 100 people and I see them all get to the point where they need to come up with a solution and everybody's able to do it. And I feel really good about that. Yeah. No, oh, that's that's awesome. It, it definitely the um, the voting is very unique, but also kind of very familiar as someone who worked in startup teams when we were locked in the same room trying to create a product. Yeah, well, yeah. oftentimes you 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 um, you know you use a vote, uh, and the CEO is still in the room, so of course you vote, and then of course the CEO decides anyway, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so that dynamic works really, really well. And then I loved when I first saw the, the map um, because I was um, actually at the time working on a kind of a mind mapping, system mapping tool uh, oh, yeah. as a side project for myself yeah. because I always thought that is the essence of design is to understand how things come together and where the points of potential intervention or the challenges are, right. and, you know, and, you know, when I read it, I was like, oh, you know, they get it. And, and, um, it, and, and, and of course, in the context of the sprint, it comes exactly at the right time and you keep um, fleshing it out with the experts and, and, you know, you end up, we, you emerge from the first day with such clarity Uh even after the first day, which is, you know, is quite incredible. It's quite, you know, I, th- I think that's definitely one of my favorites. Uh, m- m- the other favorite thing for, uh, for me is the, and I wonder if this was just an existing thing that I didn't, wasn't aware of, but the audacity of <laughs> taking a group of people into a room and saying, everything you do for the next week is timed with a timer. And oh yeah, and you have twenty minutes to do this and forty five minutes to do this. You know, did you did you see something else that, that had a similar thing, or did or did you just like? Yeah, there were two. There were two things that that gave me that idea. One of them was well, maybe three. Because well, the first thing was just the fact that I had so often worked under a deadline, and like I knew that you could do more stuff when you're under a deadline, and that's not. Right. Everybody knows that, I guess. But like that went back to me working on the high school newspaper. And like we had the, what we called hell night was like the night before it went to press. And, you know, we're up late, like printing stuff out and putting like hot wax on it and like gluing it down onto, you know, laying it all out and sending it off to be printed. And, um, and like, you can get it done every time before the deadline because you have to. And like, yeah. and it was the same way with that Encarta story with doing those drawings and trying to put together like the pitch to the, to the VP. And it was the same way with those, you know, those weeks that I had in Gmail or the week with what became Google Meet. It was just mm-hmm. like when there's pressure and, you know, whether you're working alone or together, you can get it done and you find right. a way. Right. And, um, and I always kind of loved those moments. Like they were, they were like, it was good stress. Like it felt really like yeah. you're just locked in and it's that feeling of possibility. And so I knew it was possible. I was exposed to at Google, like I said, these design thinking workshops. And in those workshops, there was a schedule for the workshop. And so the, the MC uh, or the, you know, the person kind of running it would say we're doing this activity and you have X amount of time to do it. And, you know, Mm -hmm. these would be groups of like, it might be, um, they were usually big. It was usually like there might be 20 people or 50 or 200 or something. And Mm -hmm. you're sort of like wrangling everybody. It's like, okay, this next thing we're going to take, you know, um, you do, how might we know So we're going to spend, you know, 20 minutes or whatever. And, and so I had this sense of like, you keep time and then you're like maybe counting down a little bit, but it's a different dynamic in a small room to time things. And it, the, at first I didn't, I like, I just kind of had to do it organically just is, which is hard. Like you just kind of like have to sort of try to steer the conversation to keep people moving. And Mm -hmm. that's hard. Like you try to kind of nudge people to wrap up and, and, um, 
And it's, if you start off and you say, I'm going to facilitate this thing we're going to do this week. And is that all right with everybody? And that's something that uh, my friend Charles Warren taught me to do at the beginning of facilitating. It helps you ask for permission. And then, you know, and then you kind of like, well, you kind of try to negotiate, but it's much easier when you have this schedule and you have a timer. And so this big moment was when I went into my son's classroom and I saw this thing, the time, time, time timer. timer. You have one? Yep. And, I have one here. and I was like, oh, wow. Because I, I picked it up and I like saw how it worked. And I was like, where did you get this to the teacher? Like, what is this thing? And I, awesome. I took a photo of it and I like went and I bought like, you know, I bought a couple right away. And that was, then that makes a big difference yeah. because then if you have a schedule and you have the timer, then like, I don't know, I guess you're right. There is, I guess there's a little bit of audacity to it, but it built up from a lot of things. Yeah. And then by that time too, I was just, I would get so, I, I am very impatient and it's funny because I mean, you know, you and I have been talking here for quite a while. Like, you know me, like I ramble a lot. Like I'm not like this super condensed, like always on time doing things. I'm late all the time and I talk too much. And yet it really makes me mad when like, not mad, but like I get aggravated when people are just talking and talking and talking mm. in a meeting. And when, like, when we're trying to get something done and I'm like, Whoa, like we're not, let's come on, you know, and it, yeah. it just annoys me. And so the sense, of, that the sense of possibility on the other side of that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Outside of here. And so, <laughs> the, so I think the thing that made me like rude enough to bring this timer for children into like an, like a, an office where there's just like five people who are all sitting right there was that I just get so, I get so frustrated with mm. things going slow and I, and I just wanted to see what would happen. And I do remember it was like a bit, like doing that for the first time, like once I had done it and I knew it worked, it felt, it felt different to bring it out. But the first time it was like pretty, yeah. it was, it was pretty like dickish to say like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to time you all right now. Yeah. Um, I, you yeah. know, I have, um, I have certain aspects of the sprint in my contract when someone books me and it says you, you are stating that you are aware that this is a time <laughs> process that you can't just go into freestyle conversation that everything is time oh, that the discussion that's is a good idea. formulated and i ha and i make clients read it before they sign because um it's important to note that, that they know what they're getting and also yeah. it's important that i'm not liable to produce any results if they're not obeying the yeah the process totally um that's good so, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really cool and it works really well. And, and you're right with, once you bring the timer, it just works. Yeah. Um, and people love it. Yeah. I mean, that I, maybe I've just blocked it out and people have told me that it made them feel uncomfortable. But what I usually hear is like, that was great. Like, where do we get one of those timers? And like, finally, you know, yeah. so it's a, it's an unmet need. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we went way over time and I want to give you a chance to talk about what you care about most these days and what's, you know, any, any projects that you're passionate about. I mean, I, I we, we just skipped yeah. like seven awesome questions, but, uh, oh, yeah. but, well, but you, I think we'll have to do it again. We'll have to do part two. Um, have to. Yeah. I, I'm most passionate right now. My project that I'm most passionate about is being a dad and it is not a new project, but it's a, this is a, it's a trying time to, you know, as we just talked about at the beginning, yeah. it's like a trying time to be a kid. And so I feel like my number one re responsibility and I'm super lucky to, to have the kind of work that can be often, you know, can be set aside a lot of the time or rescheduled or work around. Um, yeah. uh, but I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out how to do a good job of, of, of that. And, um, and this is one of those contexts where you do see that the, the default things while stupid, like the walls or the tunnels or whatever they are, those things while stupid, they actually do, they, there's a lot of wisdom to them as well. Mm. And uh, so there's wisdom to the structure of school because it lets kids go and have a, have a life away from their family and get to be their own selves and mm. be around their peers. And, um, and they can't, it's not easy unless like you 
have a long-term friendship. Like a nine-year-old doesn't have a conversation like you and I are having right now, just mm-hmm. like over video. Like for him, video class school, it's like, it's different. And it's not, it doesn't have a lot of the good stuff that that default setting has. And so mm-hmm. just trying to figure that out. That's like the number one project. And I, you know, I don't, um, I am trying to kind of come back to those principles of possibility and, um, and, and, you know, um, we're trying to read things a little bit to be inspired by it, but a lot of it is just trying to like, this is in many ways, it's, it's an unprecedented situation where you like, you just sort of have to question what, what matters and what's important. I have other projects that like, I have projects for the design sprint. I have a million ideas about things that I'd like to do. And I'm only able to do the very first, you know, like the, the things that don't take too much focus that are at the top of priority. They're like on the matrix. They're like, they're like fairly easy Mm. and really important. And I can't Mm. do the ones that are hard and important, which I'd I'd like to do. Mm. Um, I, as you know, I've been working on the science fiction book for a while. I did manage to finish a first draft of it during the early quarantine. Uh, It's a mess though. And I need to come back to it, but I, I'm going to have to, I want to read it. Can I read it? Oh uh, no, man, but... it's got, it has like, it has gaps and like the plot. Would, I mean, maybe I might let you, I might let you read it. Uh, I, I I'm, will be first of all, huge science fiction fan. Uh, read every book about writing that you can imagine. Cause I yeah. was trying to write yeah. for a while. Um, and, um, and I give really good feedback cause I was an editor. Uh, early I, uh, this, uh, okay. Here my, here my, <laughs> my hesitancies about it. Number one, um, I know a lot of the things that are bad about it. So I don't need, I don't need. You want to like, fix some things first. Yeah. 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 It's like, it's, it's like, it's so, it's so flawed that I'm like, well, yeah, you're gonna, I know, I know, like, I know that chapter just says like, no, TK, but, con- but congrats- about, That's funny. Like, <laughs> congratulations though. I mean, the finishing a crappy first draft is it's something a huge yeah, step. Something. Yeah. 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 Um, and the other thing is one thing that I, I worry about is like burning, uh, like you will only be able to read it for the first time once, you know, like yeah. I, so, so I really like, I want you to be able to, I want your, your feedback will be really good. You're like at this intersection of a lot of things where I thought like, you will be an amazing test reader. Mm. I want it to be, I want to be able to like act I want to get feedback from you that I don't expect. And Mm. like, I'm sure I would right now, but like Mm. so much of it is, is like clearly broken that Mm. it's not, it would sort of be not fair to you. And I don't, I don't think I would be burning that silver bullet in like the best way. That's fine. (laughs) Um, Yeah, no, it's uh, that's, by the way, that's a classic, uh, a classic author move is like, I'm saving you for round two. Like, you're yeah, not- but there is no round. I mean, there's nobody like, I won't even let my wife read it right now. It's just like, it's so, I, I don't know if I'll ever even be able to finish this book because I'm trying to, I'm trying to do so many things that I don't know how to do. It's like, uh, the, yeah. And I, I'm part of and that's that's a that's actually a problem with the you know like the book shouldn't be so complicated that you can't do it like that's mm. the, uh, I remember reading have, um, do you read Stephen King yeah so have you read uh, the JFK book um, eleven twenty two uh, I know of it but no I haven't read it um, I, I really like that one a lot and he so the the premise is like this basic the simple like simple thing is it's set in sort of contemporary times and this guy comes across a there's like a doorway that will take him back into like the 1950s in in the same small town where he lives in the u.s and um he he decides to try to stop the jfk assassination because he's like what's the most good i can do with this like amazing thing i've stumbled on and he thinks well like knowing that like knowing what will happen, what could I change in the course of history? And he, and he sort of supposes that there's a chain reaction of bad things that happen because of the assassination and mm-hmm. that, it, and that it involves like Vietnam and like other things. And so he's like, well, maybe I can stop some of that from happening. So he, so that's sort of what, but a lot of the book is just him, like 
go, like being back in the, it's, it's really good. And it's like this, you know, a stranger came to town. Like, as he goes, yeah. he's, he's, a, he's a stranger in the past. Um, Sounds like a, a fairly well-defined uh, contained story because yeah. it's such a clear goal right up front. Yeah. Which is really good. And I'm, I, I find Stephen King like inspiring, but also like frustrating to look at as a model for how to do things because I think his, he is so unique and some of so his good. abilities to pull things off that are very hard. But then he also does have this like clarity, like that's an example of like what a great, great clarity of purpose where like you can explain the premise of the book right off the bat and you're like, okay, I kind of want to see what's going to happen. Yeah. But, um, but he talks about in the, in the, he has a note at the end or the beginning of the book where he basically came up with the idea for that in like the seventies or something. And he, he couldn't, he tried to start writing and he couldn't do it. And he, he said he like, wasn't, he needed like more practice writing. Mm. And so he came back to it like, 30 years later or something and, and actually wrote it. And it yeah. took him much longer than his, usually his books are like, he just bangs out like two books a year. It's two like 800 page books a year. But this one took like, it took like, I think two or three years. And, interesting. Uh, I should read And this. he had to wait to do it, which is like, it's, it's super interesting. Yeah. The book is like, I think the book is so great. And then at the very end, I feel like he tries to explain the time travel stuff too much and he doesn't stick the landing. This is always like, to me, Stephen King, like rarely, I haven't read that many of his books, but like when he starts to try to explain why things are happening, right. I don't think that usually lands to my yeah. satisfaction. But when, when he doesn't, I just, his voice, his writing voice is so enjoyable. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I totally agree with that. That's, um, He's, uh, he's, he's great with the mystery and he's great with, uh, also like he has some realistic stories that are unbelievable. I found his book about writing to be super, super oh, yeah. good. Uh, it is really good. It um, is really good. But, but, but I yeah. struggle with that too. I've been like, I've been following that advice a lot, like thinking this is what, cause there's this part of what I find so inspiring about it. Well, what do you find inspiring about it? What's to you? What's the, what's the essence? If you like kind of boiled it down, what's the of, essence? Of King? Of that uh, book, of on writing. What that makes you inspired by it? Um, just the overall, like looking at writing as a craft and uh, that you can learn and that kind of this, this deep lifelong, um, view into it so there's many many great tips about writing and like no how, how to not use adjectives or you know whatever yeah. uh yeah. but there's also just this like the psychology of writing and you know just you know how to s just sit down and write a crappy first version and you know all, there's a there's a lot of stuff that yeah. you kind of this is a this is a, a a man who lived his whole life writing and in, he he knows what works and um that's what i found i mean i read it many years ago so it's hard to kind of remember more detail but yeah i um i think there's this essence of like uh joy that he seems to have with his work mm -hmm. like and 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 like but combined with like sort of a a soft focus like he there's this like this this mix of like he does consider it a craft and he takes it seriously mm. and and he t his focus on it is very serious and yet he's very like he just writes the book right and then he puts it away for a few weeks and then he writes a second draft mm. and then he sends it off and he's done and he and he's kind of like like it's just to him i think the essence is like he has joy in the writing. Like the writing is what's fun and he doesn't want to make it perfect. He doesn't care. He knows, he yeah. knows like it's not, you know, it, like his very, uh, he's like, he's like just being, you know, he's sort of doing yeah. it and being is that's the impression that you get rather than like yeah. holding on and trying to perfect. And I find that super inspiring. And then at the same time, it's like, he is a freak like his ability to, 
tell stories and his yeah. ability to write. It does come from really hard work. And I think it comes from him following a sense of possibility from when he was a kid. Like he was way into horror and mm -hmm. stories and like writing when he was a kid. So he has like so many more reps than anybody else. Yeah. But like, but he's also like a freak. And so there's, it's hard too, because you, you read it and like, you can't take every, you can't compare yourself to freaks in life. You know, like you can't like, you can't compare yourself to like a freak athlete or like a freak, you know, business person or like you just, you can't cause it's yeah. like, did you, did you watch uh, the movie Amadeus? No. Oh my God. It's so good. Oh my God. It's exactly what you're talking about. It's this, um, it's the story of Mozart and this other composer who's <laughs> kind of living at the uh, same time, Salieri. Oh man. And that just love hate relationship because you know yeah. clearly this guy is a genius, but like yeah, I'll never be that. Yeah. And um, it, it's 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 dark and funny and it's, it's really really great. Oh uh, yeah, check that out. Um, but um, but talking about yeah, you can't. I mean, but it's still a better book to read. Have you have you heard of the War of Art? Yeah, I have that book. It's yeah. a horrible, depressing book. <laughs> um, when I read, when I read it, I was like, okay, if this is what it takes to be a writer, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Stephen King is like, on writing is inspiring. Yeah. I think like yeah. you read that and you're like, all right, let's do this. You know, let's go. And that's much more. Yeah. That's what you, what you need. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, I did not finish reading the war of art. But the, there's an essence to it that's valuable. Like I like the idea of the resistance and like seeing things as resistance that don't need to be res like that, you know, like that you don't have to pay attention to. Like I have resistance to give you the draft. I should just send you the first draft. I'll send you the first draft. Like it's, I've told you already, it's a, it's hot garbage. Like, but then you can decide, but you can, you can read it or not, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and like, it's, it's the resistance telling me like, you shouldn't see it. Like I could let you see it. It'll probably be productive for me to be less precious about it. Yeah, it's um, up to you. Um, but but, uh, but I, I'd be happy to read it. I mean, and and actually, it's if it's um, that could serve me. If it's really bad, I could be like, hey, this guy wrote Sprint, and he can still write <laughs> really bad science fiction. That's encouraging to me. <laughs> um, but uh, but cool. So um, yeah, so. Thanks so much. I mean, we're way, way, way over time, but um, you know, I definitely would love to uh, to do this again. This was so much fun. Um, yeah, we'll do we'll do round two. We'll get to the questions. Awesome. And uh, but if you um, if you want to say where can people find you, uh, where can they find your poetry or your you know yeah. whatever you have. Um, I would I would say the best things to. Uh, Go to jakenap.com and you can find my, uh, I have a newsletter there and, um, and I have a podcast called Jake and Jonathan that you can look up. Um, and that's probably the best. I, I'm really like not doing Twitter and stuff now. So don't even bother with that. <laughs> don't even bother with Twitter. <laughs> yeah. uh, the but, new player uh, yeah. is really good. Um, you know, and the uh, website still has a lot of content and the uh, spring book, uh, website also has some really great oh, yeah. content. Yeah, that's a good one too. The sprintbook.com if you want more sprint stuff. We're about to do launch a new version of that. So uh, any, cool. any day now. Um, cool. And uh, yeah, yeah. Dude, thanks for having me on. It's super fun. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time and uh, and have a great week. And and, um, and I can't wait to, if you want to send me the draft, can't wait for it. Okay, okay, cool. Right. right on. You got thanks. it. All right, that's it for today. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to support it, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast app or wherever you're listening. It helps many more people discover the podcast and also makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. Uh, we run design sprints all over the world, um, and our goal is to improve outcomes, whether in business or uh, various organizations through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone. See you next week on Remake. <laughs>